It's, it's horrifying, isn't it? You really can't imagine the hor horrific effects of war. But the emotional destruction uh, takes a long time to unpack. Bringing a message of faith in a time of horror. The Supreme Court tackles arguments over the First Amendment and prayer at the 50-yard line. We're joined by attorney Paul Clement, who represented the high school coach at the center of the case. We all have different ethnic backgrounds, different classes, different levels of education. We come from different parts of the country and different parts of the world, but we all pray the same way. New polling data sheds light on the black Catholic experience in America. We take a deep dive into the numbers and talk to a well-known priest about the importance of black Catholics feeling seen in their parishes. A celebration marking 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. A look inside the faith in one of the world's most Catholic countries. As a grandparent, I've always said all you have to do is love them. And we take you to a unique workshop designed to help grandparents teach grandchildren the importance of having God in their lives. EWTN News In Depth starts now. How good people can die in this way. It's hard. It is hard. Catholic priests on a humanitarian aid mission from the United States are overwhelmed by the senseless death and waste of the war in Ukraine. Their visit to the war-ravaged country comes as a wave of high-level support from around the globe solidifies behind Ukraine. On Thursday, a visit to President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kyiv from the Secretary General of the United Nations. This war must end, and peace must be established in line with the Charter of the United Nations and international law. And I'm here to say to you, Mr. President, and to the people of Ukraine, we will not give up. Antonio Guterres said the International Criminal Court must seek accountability for what he called unacceptable violations of human rights. And he called out the U.N. Security Council for not doing everything it could to prevent the war. The U.N. continues to work towards the evacuation of civilians in Mariupol, which he said Russian President Vladimir Putin agreed to in principle during the Secretary General's visit to Moscow two days prior. Yet immediately after the guterres Zelensky meeting ended, the Russians fired five cruise missiles into central Kyiv near their location. This provocation comes just days after the Russians suspended natural gas exports to Poland and Bulgaria over the country's refusal to pay in Russian rubles. It's also seen as retaliation against European neighbors for Western sanctions and a signal that Putin is willing to use the continent's heavy reliance on Russian natural gas as political leverage. Several European leaders are calling it blackmail, as is the president of the United States. We will not let Russia intimidate or blackmail their way out of these sanctions. We will not allow them to use their oil and gas to avoid consequences for their aggression. Aggression will not win. Threats will not win. Russia is the aggressor. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Russia is the aggressor, and the world must and will hold Russia accountable. The president pledged additional financial support to Ukraine days after the highest level American visit to Kyiv since the Russian invasion. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin held a three hour meeting with President Zelensky. Blinken said it was important to have a face to face conversation pledging America's support. Ukraine clearly believes that it can win. And so does everyone here. We have much more to do. Ukraine needs our help to win today, and they will still need our help when the war is over. After leaving Kyiv, Secretary of Defense Austin convened a meeting of military leaders from more than 40 countries at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. The goal, to work as allies to understand and meet Ukraine's changing military needs. Just as important is humanitarian aid to Ukrainians suffering right now across the country. EWTN News in-depth reporter Colin Flynn traveled to Ukraine with a group of American Catholic priests who saw for themselves the devastation of war and the overwhelming need for faith and compassion. Their visit coincided with Eastern Orthodox Holy Week and Easter last Sunday.
On the grounds of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in the town of Bucha, just outside Kiev, three priests from the U.S. stand and pray. They are praying at the site of a mass grave where 30 people were buried after the fighting started when the Russians invaded. The priests stand here, trying to take in the reality of what's in front of them. One of the priests is Father Israel Perez. It's an hard, a hard experience for me. I can't imagine how good people can die in this way. It's hard. It is hard. Very sad. Another is Father Sebastian Sardo. Here I feel uh, the cold, but the cold in my heart. I never in my life thought I, I can see a place like this. They are being led by Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the national director for the Pontifical Mission Societies in the US. Today is Good Friday, uh, and our Lord uh, was uh, hung up on a cross as a criminal and laid in an unmarked grave. And then you think about an unmarked grave, what can you say? Monsignor Harrington, Father Sebastian and Father Israel are on a mission from the U.S. Pontifical Mission Societies to bring aid and supplies to the Ukrainian people. This is unbelievable. We're here outside this apartment block outside Kiev and you can see, we think tanks or heavy artillery have taken out huge chunks of the wall. All the windows are shattered. Just unbelievable destruction that has been left in the path of the Russians. It's, it's horrifying, isn't it? You really can't imagine the horrib, horrific effects of war. But the emotional destruction uh, takes a long time to unpack. First of all, being here, showing them my closeness, my love, and telling them that there are hope. I think that hope will win, always. Outside an apartment block, where apartments on the top floors are still burnt out from bombing, a resident tells them that her son was serving in the military and died. The priest listen carefully as she recounts the nightmare of her building being attacked. There are still burnt bodies upstairs that haven't yet been retrieved, she tells them. Other locals come over as well, you can see that they take comfort that the priests are here to listen. They give them aid and a blessing, and they continue on their journey. <laughs> the group travels to Lviv in the west of Ukraine, where 170 refugees are taking shelter at the St. Joseph Basilian Monastery and Seminary on the outskirts of the city. This seminary offers the refugees a safe haven for as long as they need. Father Israel gives the children beautiful cards made by children in Catholic schools in New York. The cards bring a smile to the children's faces. It's a small but kind gesture offering messages of support and hope from other children their own age. And as dawn breaks on Easter Sunday morning, the local faithful come out in numbers at St. George's Cathedral in Lviv to celebrate the risen Christ.
Monsignor Harrington, Father Israel and Father Sebastian celebrate with the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in a beautiful ceremony, all the more meaningful and powerful at a time like this. You know, the challenge always when uh, you have an experience of this kind of aggression is that you can give yourself permission to hate. And God created us for love. I hope from our visit, what they found is, is that we were accompanying them, that we were walking with them during this Holy Week, uh, that they weren't alone. Evil may have its day, but the kingdom is what is going to reign. And it's my hope that the people here uh, continue to keep faith and hope in the Easter joy that is ultimately their promise. In Ukraine, Colum Flynn for EWTN News in Depth. On Eastern Orthodox Easter, Pope Francis sent a message to the heads of Eastern churches asking that they join together to become true peacemakers, especially for war-torn Ukraine. Because the Pope has been so vocal on the war and because Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill has been equally vocal on the other side in support of Vladimir Putin, the role of religion is taking an outsized role in this conflict. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser joins us from Rome to discuss. Andreas, the war in Ukraine is clearly far from over. Despite many peace initiatives, Pope Francis has long publicly advocated for an end of the violence. But the Vatican said last week a second summit between the pontiff and Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill this June was canceled. Here we see a video from their first historic meeting in Cuba in 2016. The Pope said a meeting between the two right now could cause what he called a lot of confusion. What does this cancellation mean for relations between the Catholic and Russian Orthodox Church? And where does it leave the peace process? Well, Monty, I think it's very important to remember that um, the, the conversations about this meeting the, between the Pope and, and, and the Patriarch, this um, new meeting now, because they already met, uh, as, you, as we're seeing here already uh, in the past, has the, the conversations about this, they have started long ago. And uh, they have started, in fact, before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. However, now there have been hopes that there could be a meeting, uh, maybe possibly even during the trip to Lebanon, which should take place in June of the Holy Father, uh, that he would also at least spend a little bit of time in Jerusalem, which would be an ideal place and a neutral ground to meet, to meet the patriarch. As you said, this could send the wrong, uh, the wrong signal right now, and therefore, it's been postponed indefinitely. So this is, of course, not ideal for the relations there. But I think in this situation, it also shows the clear stance of the Holy See when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Andreas, not to get too philosophical, but could you tell us more about the role of religion in this conflict? Well, I interviewed Cardinal Kurt Koch, who is really the expert on other Christian churches, especially the Orthodox churches, and has been leading this dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches, including the Russian Orthodox Church, for a long time. Let's listen to what he had to say to the role of religion. I would not say that religion plays a role, but the abuse of religion plays a significant role. In Ukraine, Christians are killing Christians. Orthodox kill Orthodox. And that is something terrible. The Russian Orthodoxy sees itself as a defender of persecuted Christians around the world. And this is a wonderful idea and important. We have to raise our voices for the persecuted. But when Christians start to kill each other, how credible is this? Therefore, I support what Pope Francis has said. A religious legitimization of the war is blasphemy. Whoever legitimizes war in the name of God does not speak in the name of our Christian God. So religion should never be used to condone violence. Uh, religion, it's, it's actually an abuse of religion, uh, what Cardinal Kurt Koch said, if it's being used to, uh, to, to justify acts of war. And more specifically with the atrocities that we're seeing here. So what then really is the position of the Russian Orthodox Church in this war? 
it's very clearly that the Russian Orthodox Church never took, at least Patriarch Kirill, never took a real clear stance against this war, against the violence, against the invasion. And uh, that has been a problem. Colonel Kurt Koch also commented on that. There was this conversation between Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill of Moscow for the Patriarch. It was very important to be in touch with the Pope. The Pontiff was, however, very clear in this conversation and urged for peace and an immediate end of war. He made it clear that it is the average person who is paying this very high price for war, the faithful, our flock. The Pope said, Non siamo clerici cello stato, siamo pastori. We are not clerics of the state, but pastors. Therefore, we have to radically stand up for peace. It's very clear that the church is at the service of the faithful and not at the service of the state. And this is something that Pope Francis also brought into consideration, um, addressed to Patriarch Kirill. It's a very important consideration. Andreas, thank you so much for being with us to explain this. Thank you. There's so much more ahead. Stay right there. A lot of black Catholics, I think, they need to know that and it be acknowledged that they're being heard. A look at what it means to be a black Catholic in America. We have recent research plus thoughts shared from the heart. A big anniversary celebration of faith in the Philippines brought to us through the eyes of our reporter who calls the Philippines home. Love their grandchildren where they're at because that's, I think that's the biggest piece. Sometimes we have to love people that we're not always comfortable with where they're at, and we don't always approve of what they're doing, so how do we accompany them and love them where they are? And grandparents connecting to grandchildren. Instructors explain their lesson plan to bring faith to the younger generation. EWTN News In Depth will be right back. Understanding the diversity of our Catholic Church helps us understand who we need to reach out to in order to share the gospel. A recent Pew Research poll found only 4% of Catholics in the U.S. are black. Mark Irons spoke with black Catholic laypersons and leaders to get a better understanding of their experience practicing the faith. Our race is a stepping stone to connect us. It shouldn't divide us. Deacon Gerard Marie Anthony speaks about growing up the son of interracial and interfaith parents. His father was Protestant and mother Catholic. A lot of times as a black Catholic, it was go to mass, uh, but then also my dad's services, they were a lot longer. So I spent a lot of time in church growing up. He now dedicates his life in service to the Catholic church. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. In 2017, he was ordained a permanent deacon for the Diocese of Arlington in Virginia. There aren't many black Catholic clergymen in America. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops reports around 1% of all U.S. priests are black. Among the laity, 4% of U.S. Catholic adults are black. Numbers aside, Deacon Anthony has seen one stereotype take root throughout his experience. A lot of African-American communities think that Catholicism is just a white religion. Um, I do see that as a huge problem. In the U.S. at large, African-Americans are a minority, but that fact stands out even more within the Catholic Church. A 2022 Pew Research study looks closer at where people worship in the U.S. 80% of white Catholics attend church where most people are white. 67% of Hispanic Catholics attend church where most people are Hispanic. And 68% of black Protestants attend church where most people are black. But only 25% of black Catholics worship where most people are black. Unlike the other groups, most black Catholics in the U.S. are in the racial minority in their churches, including at Deacon Anthony's home parish. The number of black parishioners at this Catholic church in Chantilly, Virginia, does reflect the findings of the Pew survey, but the research doesn't contain all the answers. At least not until very recently have I ever thought of myself as having an identity as a black Catholic. I'm just Catholic. Benta Brown and her mother are parishioners at St. Timothy. They feel very welcomed in this church community. They say their religion isn't about race. It's about the truth found in Catholicism. Still, Benta describes feeling like a stranger in some Catholic parishes. There are some churches I'll go to where I don't feel welcome by other parishioners, but I always feel welcome. Sorry. I always feel welcome by God. 
I always feel welcome and invited by the Holy Spirit. I always feel this draw to the Eucharist. You know, I don't think that I could leave if, if I tried my hardest because there's always this draw to God. There are approximately three million black Catholics in the U.S. Despite their small percentages in the American church as a whole, the Pew study may suggest they are providing a big gift to the universal church through their own individual commitment to prayer. The study finds black Catholics are more likely than other Catholics to pray at least once a day, rely on prayer when making decisions, and read scripture outside of services at least once a week. And this is why the culture, even in Africa, they're booming. I mean, the converts in Africa are booming. They're actually the fastest growing section of the Catholic Church. And hopes to build up the future of the church in the U.S. must include continued outreach to black Catholics, percentage-wise a younger community than white Catholics. The Pew study reports 69% of white Catholics are 50 years of age or older, while 52% of black Catholics are under 50. And Benta Brown believes regardless of race, age, or any categorizations that can divide us, a welcoming spirit must be shared with all for the church to thrive. If we are seeing Christ in every human being, then we cannot close our hearts to the person who's sitting next to us. Jesus Christ welcomed the prisoner, the tax collector, the prostitute, the sinner. All of us and all of our imperfections, this great love he brought us all to the table. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. Leadership reflecting all backgrounds and races is essential in our global church. I had the opportunity to talk about this with one of the best known black priests in America. Author and podcaster Father Josh Johnson has reached thousands of followers. We spoke about the challenges he sees and what needs to be done to create a more inclusive church. Thank you for joining us, Father Johnson. Let's talk about black Catholics. They make up 4% of U.S. Catholics. 70% of them are U.S. born. Is current growth in the black community coming from the U.S. or from immigration from Africa and the Caribbean? You know, it, that's an interesting question. And so a lot of it is coming from immigration from Africa and the Caribbean, but some of it is also coming from parishes in our nation who right now are focusing on uh, their communities that they, they live in. Uh, a lot of our churches have very diverse neighborhoods. And for, for many years, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, the leadership in our church didn't always prioritize the people in their geographical boundaries. But mm -hmm. canon law says that a pastor is responsible for every single person in his boundaries, whether they're Catholic, Protestant, atheist, agnostic, Muslim, Hindu, Jew, black, white, Latino, Asian, or indigenous, male or female, young or old. We're responsible for everybody. So there are parishes right now, and there are um, organizations and apostles and institutions um, that are actually prioritizing all people, including the many African Americans who live in the geographical boundaries of their Catholic churches. That's right. Well, let's look at then the issue issues of sexual morality for the church. According to this Pew Research study, black Catholics tend to be more tolerant than other Catholics on abortion and homosexuality. Has that been true in your experience as a pastor, or are they way off? Well, again, not in my experience as a pastor. The black Catholics I walk with are very pro-life, and just as many white people who struggle with uh, sexual morality, a lot of people um, more than not struggle with sexual morality. I think we like to live in a world where we think everybody um, is being obedient to all the teachings of Christ in the church. Um, but I think that just as many white people struggle with it as black people um, in, in my experience. Um, but as far as the, the disciples of Jesus Christ who I've ministered to as a pastor, as a vocation director, and as a priest who works on our commission for racial harmony, um, the African Americans I'm walking with, they've embraced John Paul II's theology of the body. They've embraced the teachings of the church. And so uh, I, I can't say whether or not that um, that poll is accurate. As sometimes uh, I wasn't polled when they did the poll and the, the black people who I'm walking with right now, my diocese, many of them weren't polled as well. So um, yeah, I can't really speak to who was invited to that, that conversation and not. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, the study also said something about the importance of actively opposing racism to the retention yes. of the black community within the church. Should the church take a larger role in this conversation, and what should that look like? Yes, the church should, and the church could. And if the church would, then our world would be a better place, right? The church has the tools and the resources and the capacity to transform civilization. And so uh, when I'm not wearing my clerics, I work out every day. 
when I go to the gym, sometimes I go get a drink after at, at one of the, the gas stations. I, I literally, to this day, uh, I get followed in the store when I'm not wearing my clerics. And so racial prejudice is still very high. Racial stereotypes are still very off. Racial discrimination is still happening all the time. And there are still unjust practices and policies that are negatively affecting uh, people of color in our land. So I'll give you a quick example of what the church can do. It's what the church did in New Orleans. Archbishop Alfred Hughes, he became aware that a lot of black Catholics were leaving his archdiocese. And instead of taking the posture of, of, I know why they're leaving, he actually invited them to the table and he listened to them. He said, what don't I know that I need to know? And they informed him that there was a country club in their area that their parishes were using. This country club had a practice that said black people cannot be members. Y'all, this was in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. This was the 2000s. Like, this is recent years. And there was a practice at a country club that said black people can't be members, right? So when he became aware of this practice, Archbishop Hughes wrote a pastoral letter against racism, and he specifically called out every institution and organization in his archdiocese that did not allow diverse membership. This letter was read in all the parishes, and when it was read, a lot of Catholics who hosted their events there no longer hosted events there. Mm. A lot of Catholics who were members there left their membership, and when they did this, the country club lost money. When they lost money, they changed their practice, and they began to invite all people to join this country club. This only happened because someone within the church listened to people who were hurting and believed them and their stories of their experiences of racism and worked with them to transform society. And it worked. And this literally happens all the time in the ministry I do in my diocese with our Commission on Racial Harmony. We listen to people, their stories. We hear what they're going through. We become aware of things that we might not have known. And then with them, we work together to, to transform these practices and policies through our prayer, through our fasting, through return of correction, uh, through meetings, through dialogues, um, even through protests. Like many of the saints participate in protests. So, through all these things that saints have done throughout the history of our church, we're doing today, we can do more. And when we do this, our church will be the reason why the world is transformed. But unfortunately, too often, it's the world who's having a bigger impact on the church. And the church, and I say the church, I mean people within the church, the body of Christ, we're listening to political figures and political ideologies and all these other things as opposed to like fulfilling the demands of discipleship and right. being in relationship with the body of Christ and working with the body of Christ to build what St. John Paul II prayed for, a civilization of love. That's right, acting with the heart of the church. One last question. In the universal church, feeling seen is an important part of accompaniment. You have a book called On Earth As It Is In Heaven, Restoring God's Vision of Race and Discipleship. Tell us what prompted you to write this book. You know, I, I want the church on earth to look like the church in heaven. What does the church in heaven look like? John, the beloved disciple, he had a vision of the church in heaven in the book of Revelation. And he said, I see people of every race, nation, tribe, and tongue. Why did he see that? Because in Acts chapter 2, the apostles and the other disciples, when they received the Holy Spirit, the very first thing they did was they broke out of their holy huddle and they went to people of every race, nation, tribe, and tongue. They went to people from Africa, Asia, and Europe. The apostles, they were martyred in different lands. Thomas was martyred in India. Matthew was martyred in Africa. Uh, Peter was martyred in Europe. The apostles went to all these different lands to share the joy of the gospel and the fruit of their, their witness, the fruit of their testimony, the fruit of their, their lives, was the people in their land became Catholic, the people in their land became saints. And John saw that. I believe in our church in America right now, the most segregated hour, right, isn't going to be when people are at school, are at work, are playing sports. The most segregated hour in our land today is the same it was when Martin Luther King Jr. was alive, and it is 11 o'clock a.m. on Sunday morning. That's right. This breaks the heart of Jesus. He wants for us to look at our geographical boundaries, the people who live in our community of our church parishes, and invite everybody to Jesus. A lively and important discussion. That was not the only topic we discussed with Father Johnson. We also talked about the path to sainthood for six black Americans in the church and the impact they can have on Catholicism in America. Tune in next week for the rest of our conversation. And if you want to learn about Father Johnson's latest book, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, take a look at our social media channels for our exclusive discussion on what inspired him to write it. Next, prayer on the 50-yard line. On one side, religious freedom and the free exercise and free speech clauses of the First Amendment. And on the other, the Establishment Clause and the separation of church and state. We make sense of a very important Supreme Court case in the Week in Review when we come back. News from the U.S. Supreme Court tops the Week in Review. 
The justices heard oral argument this week in a new fight for prayer on the football field. Coach Joseph Kennedy, a high school football coach in Washington State, was suspended after praying on the field. It was something he did for several years, sometimes alone and sometimes with players. The town of Bremerton told him to stop because officials there claim it violated the policy of the school district to neither encourage nor discourage religion. The school district and the lower court said the public praying would be perceived as a school endorsement of religion. Kennedy was put on paid leave when he refused to stop. The court was grappling with two questions presented to them. Does this violate the free exercise of religion, stopping a coach from praying at the 50-yard line, or does it qualify as government endorsement of religion? Argument focused on questions about the facts of the case and ultimately on whether public prayer could be considered coercive for students. Representing the coach was Paul Clement, and the school district was Richard Katsky. And the Ninth Circuit's Establishment Clause holding fails to grasp a basic teaching of this court's cases that has been said over and over again and is simple enough for even young students to understand that the government does not endorse all private religious speech just because it takes place on the school side of the gates. Some of these kids were just 14 years old. Mr. Kennedy's actions pressured them to pray and also divided the coaching staff, sparked vitriol against, uh, against school officials, and led to the field being stormed and students getting knocked down. Emotions ran high on this case, with much attention from both left and right. The group, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, rallied outside the court. As long as there are pop math quizzes, there will be prayer in the public schools. <laughs> Anybody can pray whenever they want to pray. But the point is that official empl employees of the school and officials of the school cannot engage in prayers and then try to get other people to participate with them because that clearly violates the separation of church and state. A very different view from the coach's side. Joining us to discuss Coach Kennedy's representative, attorney Paul Clement, fresh from this week's argument before the justices. Paul, it's great to have you back. There are those on two sides of this debate, those who would like to see religious beliefs freely expressed in public spaces and those who want the public square scrubbed of all religion. This phrase, the separation of church and state, has been used to keep religious groups from public prayer, displays, and partnering with the government. What does it actually mean? Well, it is really just a metaphor, and I think it's not a particularly helpful one. Um, and I think what we really need to do is to focus on the Constitution. And the Constitution had really a preference for uh, religious exercise. And it was, there, there's a clause that also talks about laws respecting an establishment of religion. Um, and that's been interpreted to stop the government from doing certain things. But in a case like Coach Kennedy's case, where what you have is not the government trying to impose some government written prayer on everyone, but just an individual who happens to be a, a coach or a teacher engaging in their own religious exercise, that's something the Constitution speaks to directly. And I don't think it's helpful to try to use a metaphor like a wall of separation uh, in lieu of looking at the text of the Constitution, which specifically protects a right to free exercise of religion. Along those lines, Mr. Katsky and some of the justices discussed the issue of coercion. You got a lot of questions about that, that Coach Kennedy's prayers would make players feel like they had to participate in order to get more playtime or to be favored for starting in the lineup. What was your response to that? So I, I had two responses, one factual, one legal. Uh, the factual response in some respects is the easiest because there was just no evidence whatsoever on this record that there was any kind of coercion like that. In fact, if you want to go outside the record, uh, the coach wrote an editorial uh, about the day of the argument where he pointed out that when two kids on his team uh, expressly wanted to opt out from participating in any kind of prayer, um, he made them team captains. So th it, just on the factual record, that's, that's, not a, that's not a real concern here. But I also want to make a legal point, because I think the legal point is equally important. You know, coercion is one of those words that can mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. And if the concern is real coercion, like a teacher who says, if you don't come to my prayer group, I won't give you an A, or a coach who says, 
if you don't engage in religious exercise with me, I'm not going to give you playing time. That's obviously problematic, and that's consistent with the idea that the Constitution protects us from the government compelling us to engage in the government's favored religious practice. But coercion has also been used to discuss things that aren't anything like that kind of direct pressure from the state. And you might describe them as, as, as really just a, a version of peer pressure or mm -hmm. the like, where the captain of the team is religious, so some of the other guys on the team maybe start taking their own religion more seriously. Or people on the team not, not being told that their playing time is at jeopardy, but they see the coach engaging in religious exercise, um, taking a knee after the game, and they become inspired to take their own religion more seriously. That kind of coercion is not unconstitutional. That kind of quote-unquote coercion is protected by the Constitution. That's the persuasive force of ideas. And good for society. Paul, Justice Breyer seemed to justify the government being forced to be neutral on religion because of the growing religious diversity in our country. Here's his comment. Let's take a listen. It could be, uh, you know, the Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Shintos, Mohammedans. They're, and one group thinks why this group is being uh, uh, favored by the school. The other one thinks what about this one and so forth. So we have a kind of neutrality. What's actually driving this neutrality? Is it a fear of public prayer? Well, I think the neutrality concern, again, like the coercion concern, um, it, it goes back to a legitimate concern that then becomes distorted. Hmm. So if the federal government wanted to say that there's only one religion in this country, um, that wouldn't be neutral and that would be problematic under our Constitution. Conversely, though, if you just recognize that we are a religious country um, and you provide a mechanism for individuals or even the state to acknowledge that. I mean, Justice Breyer has voted to uphold prayers at the beginning of legislative sessions. He was the, you know, the decisive vote in a case I argued uh, a decade or so ago that allowed a Ten Commandments monument to stay on the Capitol grounds. Uh, Justice Breyer voted to uh, allow the, the Bladensburg Cross to continue to stand in the American Legion case. Now, the critics in all those cases said the government wasn't being neutral to religion. So I think you really have to distinguish between the state expressly discriminating uh, in favor of one religion and the state allowing a recognition that, uh, that we're a religious people. And I think particularly in a case like this, where it I think fairly is described as the coach's own individual speech. Right. Uh, what neutrality should mean is that everybody gets to exercise their religious belief. And so if the coach were a Muslim and wanted to bow towards Mecca at, at the end of the game, uh, that would be equally protected. But that's how you have uh, what the court has sometimes talked about uh, as a benevolent neutrality. But the way it's been applied in some cases by some judges, it, there's nothing benevolent about it. That's right, and that's an important distinction that we'll be looking forward to in a decision. Thank you so much, Paul. Great to be with you. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF, released its annual report this week. It analyzes conditions of religious freedom, especially for religious minorities in countries around the globe. The front page of the report features Afghanistan, where the Taliban's takeover after the U.S. withdrawal has had a devastating effect. Religious minorities like Christians, Hindus, Baha'is, and others face harassment, detention, and death. Afghanistan is listed as a country of particular concern, or CPC. CPCs are countries that tolerate particularly severe violations of religious freedom that are systematic, ongoing, and egregious. They can include torture, degrading treatment, prolonged detention without charges, abduction, and denial of life, liberty, and security. The commission weighed in on cases in Afghanistan and the impact of Russia, among other cases. While we had long been concerned about conditions in Afghanistan, the Taliban's return to power has had a chilling impact on religious freedom and broader human rights environment. And what we see in Ukraine in that we've been tracking Russia internally for a number of years, making recommendations. They have been operating in uh, Crimea for since 2014. We've seen them targeting 
religious minorities. What our report points to is that Russia is an enemy to religious freedom and something that we need to track very closely. Afghanistan and Russia joined 13 other countries as CPCs, including Saudi Arabia, China, Pakistan, India, Iran, and others listed on this map. A lesser designation, but still of concern, are countries on the State Department's watch list, or SWL, which violate religious liberty. A total of 12 countries, including Cuba, Egypt, Nicaragua, Turkey, and Central African Republic, were included on the list this year. More to come. We'll be right back. Wherever they go, even if they're not in a Christian country, the Christian faith remains very um, important to them and ingrained in who they are as, as a people. We take you to an island nation rich in Catholicism and deep in faith. Next, we head to the Philippines with personal insight from our EWTN News in-depth colleague. One of the most Catholic countries in the world, the Philippines will soon have a new president in the coming weeks. The high-stakes election on May 9th comes down to either current Vice President Lenny Robredo or Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr., the son of Philippines' longtime former dictator. The Catholic Church is actively urging Filipinos to reflect and vote for a candidate who embodies love for God and country. During the Solidarity Mass for Moral Choice, the president of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines said, Our low regard and inaction to politics will not bring development. Let us not gamble the future of our country. The elections are happening as the Philippines wraps up a one-year celebration of 500 years of Christianity. EWTN News In-Depth reporter Roselle Reyes, who was born in the Philippines, shares with us the roots of the Catholic faith in the country and how it still impacts Filipino lives today. The Philippines, with more than 7,000 tropical islands, is known for its diversity. From its natural wonders to its provincial escapes rich in history and culture. But did you know the Philippines is also one of the most Catholic countries in the world? coming in third to only Brazil and Mexico. According to Pew Research, as of 2010, there were about 76 million Catholics living in the Philippines. This widespread Catholicism is a living testament of faith in the country, going 500 years strong and dating back to 1521. We call it the year of Christianity in the Philippines. So that was in 1521 when the first explorers from Spain landed no, on our soils, on our islands. And that is when presumably also they celebrated mass, did baptisms and introduced the faith. On April 21st, 1521, the cross was planted in Cebu, Philippines, signifying the birth of Christianity in the land. Father Gregory Ramon Gaston, a priest of the Archdiocese of Manila and currently rector of the Pontifico Collegio Filipino in Rome, says even though the evangelization of the Philippines is interconnected with Spanish colonialism, the Filipino people continue to profess the Catholic faith today. We continue Jesus' mission here on earth, his presence. And so this 500-year celebration also reminds us no, that, yes, we have received a lot and we continue to give. Father Gaston's words accentuate the theme of the quincentennial celebration, which is gifted to give. In celebration of its 500th anniversary, Filipinos around the world mark the milestone with masses, processions, and festivities. In a video message, Pope Francis likened Filipino faithfuls to a people who know how to accompany Jesus along the way of the cross. And in spite of devastations the Filipinos have encountered in recent years, they keep the faith strong. How many difficult moments have you suffered? I think especially during the years of immediate preparation for the Jubilee, earthquakes, typhoons, volcanic eruptions, and the COVID-19 pandemic. But in spite of all the pain and devastation, you have known how to carry the cross and continue walking. During the event, Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle, former Archbishop of Manila, and now the Prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples at the Vatican, called for more unity. The witness 
that we should give to the world of communion, of fraternity, of sisterhood, of the beauty of belonging to Christ. If we belong to Christ, we belong to each other. If we are part of Christ, the body of Christ, we are part individually of each other. The gift of faith has been handed down from generation to generation, including the identity and culture of Filipinos. Even those who didn't grow up in the Philippines, they continue to share their faith in the lands they call home. Talking to my non-Filipino friends, they'll say, you know, Filipinos are hospitable or, you know, they, they always take care of the other person or they're so kind or generous. Um, they're the first to help out. And I think subconsciously, these are all Christian values, right? It's just something that's ingrained in who we are as Filipinos because we are a Christian country. Father Patrick Augustine was born in Maryland, but thanks to his devout Catholic parents, he inherited the faith. In September last year, Father Augustine helped put together a celebration for the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines in conjunction with the Feast of San Lorenzo Ruiz at the National Shrine in Washington, D.C. So the fact that you noted that there are some young people in the you know part, uh, part of the procession uh, shows that, yes, we're doing our best to raise future generations in the faith. Deacon Ping Averia also held festivities at his church, St. Leo the Great in Fairfax, Virginia. He grew up in the Philippines and moved to Virginia in the early 90s with his wife. If you go to any country in anywhere in the world where there's a Filipino community, wherever it is, no matter how small the community is, they always have a Filipino mass. It is part of who we are. It is... Um, it is in our being, um, having that, that faith, and especially for Filipinos, is how we overcome the, the, the struggles and difficulties of life. Because we hang on to our faith uh, wherever we are. We believe that we're not alone, that God is with us. Rosal Rages, EWTN, News in Depth. Roselle joins us now to discuss her report. Roselle, this was a very personal story for you. Tell us why. Yes, it, it really is, because a lot of what is mentioned in the story is a part of my story and who I am as well. You see, growing up in the Philippines, I was fully immersed in the culture, traditions, and saw that the Catholic faith was such a big part of our everyday lives. I would say that my favorite season is Christmas time, because Filipinos, we love Christmas. <laughs> Once it hits September, you can hear Christmas songs playing. There would be a countdown to Christmas everywhere. And I remember leading up to Christmas, we attend Simbangabe, which translates to night mass in Tagalog. It's mass every day for nine days before Christmas. And then on Christmas Eve, we'd stay up and put a big feast together for Noche Buena. Um, I would say another special memory for me would be Holy Week. During that week, we would do what's called in the Philippines as Visita Iglesia, where we visit seven churches. Some visit 14 churches, actually. And in each church, we would recite the Stations of the Cross in each one. At the same time, my grandmother would explain to us the story of Jesus and how he came to be. So that was a memorable time for me as well. I also wanted to share a tradition in my hometown. So every town holds an annual celebration devoted to their patron saint. Where I'm from, Naikavite, we celebrate the Immaculate Conception on December 8th. Take a look at this video from my hometown's parish. To start the festivities, there would be a mass in church, and then it would be followed by a procession. And this procession is a, a huge parade that the community puts together. So all of these wonderful things I mentioned are just a small glimpse of what it was like growing up as a Catholic in the Philippines. A lot of traditions, a lot of different memories for you to carry with you. But as a child, you then moved to Guam. Tell us about Catholic life there. Yeah, so my family moved to Guam, which is a three-hour plane ride away from the Philippines, not too far. Guam is this beautiful island paradise, which is predominantly Catholic as well, by the way. And even though we moved away, we still kept 
the Catholic faith very much alive in our family. And I have my grandmother to thank for all of that because everything she learned in the Philippines, the way of life for Catholics, the traditions, she brought that with her. So even in Guam, we would attend Mass every Sunday and observe all the unique religious holidays observed in the Philippines. Also, a special memory for me in Guam, my older son being baptized. He's actually, I don't know if you see it much, but he's wearing the traditional Barong yeah. Tagalog. <laughs> Beautiful. You're one of our newest additions to the EWTN family here in the Washington, D.C. News Bureau. Was it easy to assimilate into the Catholic community here? Well, at first, I would say moving from such a small tropical island to a big city like D.C., it was a bit of a culture shock. Yes. But really, the, the Catholic faith is actually a part of what makes me feel at home here. In fact, we baptized my younger son last year. Here's his picture. Look at the hat. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> what a blessing. Yeah. And then my older son, you saw him earlier. He's now taking CCD classes, getting ready for First Holy Communion. And so reflecting on all the interviews I conducted, it just shows me that we all come from different places, we have different stories, but what we all have in common is that faith. Wherever we are in the world as Filipinos, we still bring that faith with us and with it, the traditions, uh, we pass it along to the next generation. So I hope that keeping with the theme, gifted to give, I'm giving all that learned from my grandmother and passing it on to my sons. It's beautiful to see you do just that. We're so glad that you're here, Rizal, and a member of our EWTN News in-depth team. We look forward to your future stories. Thanks. Grandparents need to be celebrated and encouraged for all that they do. Following in the footsteps of Saints Anne and Joachim, grandparents learn to provide spiritual guidance to those who come after them. From this workshop, it sounds like we're losing them around the age of 13. So we need to do whatever we can to keep our children aware and our grandchildren how to keep God in their life, to stay on that path. Straying from God, grandparents share their heartache over the lack of faith they see in their children and in their grandchildren. Many seniors see their children walk away from Jesus and the church, taking their grandchildren with them. But a workshop in Cleveland, Ohio, aims to help seniors bring their loved ones back home to the church. It was launched by Father Damien Ferrance, who spoke about his idea on our program a few months ago. Father Damien says he was inspired by Pope Francis's letter to seniors on the first World Day for grandparents and the elderly last July. The workshop is named after Jesus' grandparents, Saints Anne and Joachim, and it drew in a large audience. It's our feature for this week's Faith Journey in Depth. It's a, a different in many ways relationship, but a very special relationship and, and a special kind of love that they have for you and you have for them and, and you need to be there for them. If you can't change your grandchildren or change your children's attitude, you can pray that they will change. So that was, that was one major thing that I'll take away. Love and prayer, the foundation of any good Catholic relationship, were the two key takeaways from this unique workshop. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. More than 100 seniors gathered at St. Albert the Great for the comprehensive seminar on how grandparents can evangelize their grandchildren. It's like, what did I do wrong? These kids don't go to church. They don't send the grandkids to church. You know, what's what's going on here? More reason for us grandparents and parents as well to keep our children and grandchildren on the path of holiness. We're losing them. The packed room became a comfort to many who realize that they're not the only ones who see the growing loss of faith in their families and want to know how to fix it. That sends the message that the grandparents of the world, we care and we're worried about our grandchildren going off the path into sin. There's a lot of other people out there in the same situation. You're not in, no, in that boat alone. The seminar provided insight into the mindset and challenges youth face today, especially with the onset of the pandemic and growing uncertainty of the world events. They don't trust big institutions. They trust individual people. As Father Damien said, they trust you. 
this is the period of time when they're really making you know, their own ideas about how the world works. This is really important for us to know. This is the loneliest generation. While evangelizing the Catholic faith, speakers shared the importance of seniors meeting their grandchildren where they are, just as Jesus did. So not to push the faith on them, but to be at their side and help guide them. We accompany them, we journey with them, we pray with them. Grandparents learned how to share their own story of their walk with Christ, ask questions, and the vital importance of listening in order to build trust. I think it's good for the, the kids to know about us when we were younger and what our history is and how our faith life started. Once you've heard their story, you can share your story. Building new traditions and practicing the faith, like walking around a prayer garden in their backyard, can help cement a love for prayer at an early age. New traditions are a small step many said they would start implementing. I like the idea of having some little ritual thing in the house, maybe a holy water Found as, as they walk in or have a little album with uh, like the parish that I was baptized and so on and my wife because that, that really is a part of our faith life. The workshop not only gave these seniors important information on sharing the faith, but also reminded them of the special role they have as grandparents and mentors for all members of the church. It kind of refreshes and renews your, your faith. It, uh, makes you realize what an important role you have as a grandparent. And we become grandparents not just for our, our own grandchildren, but all of the, the children in the parish. We have had um, parents come up to us and say, my children have no grandparents. I would love if you would pray for them. That workshop was one of four in the Diocese of Cleveland, and it included mass celebrated by Father Ferentz. Every senior our EWTN team talked to there said they loved the workshop and that they learned a lot. The Diocese of Cleveland shared a large number of resources with participants, which we're sharing with you on our EWTN News In Depth Facebook page. The links will be pinned at the top of our Facebook page for a week for your convenience, and then you'll be able to find them in the regular feed. Giving back to the next generation and finding purpose in sharing the faith. Thank you for joining us for this edition of EWTN News In Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Join us again, same time, next week, with more news important to your Catholic life. See you then.